Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to today's SMPTE Standards webcast. Hope the weather is sunny where you are. I hear some folks out west had some snow and some ice. Uh, my son is out by uh, Yellowstone. He says it's supposed to be a blizzard there. We just got one yesterday on the East Coast. Anyway, um, today's topic is Beyond SMPTE Time Code, the TLX project. And um, I'm, I'm excited today because I uh, get to work with one of my ex-colleagues, uh, 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 who I'll introduce in a moment, but uh, I am your host, uh, Joel Welch, SMPTE's Director of Education. I'm up at the White Plains office today, so uh, uh, things do look a little different again, this uh, this webcast. Um, just uh, if this is your first time with us, uh, I do want to remind folks that the uh, standards webcasts are 60 to 90 minutes long. Try to make them interactive. That's really up to you, though. Uh, hope that you will uh, interact with us by asking questions. And believe it or not, as soon as I opened the door, we had uh, one of our uh, good friends post a question, which I will hold until later. So we already have a question in the in the queue. Um, we do cover uh, select standards. Uh, this one is not quite a standard yet. Uh, they're working on it, and uh, you'll learn more about it in, in uh, a little bit. Uh, standards webcasts are also free to everyone, and they are recorded for on-demand viewing. We post them on SMPTE.org, but we also put them on YouTube and uh, hope you will uh, go back and review the major points that uh, you might want to uh, review or have more information about. Um, but uh, we also uh, record them for folks who are unable to participate in the live uh, webcast. Um, if you do participate in social media, please tell your friends and family about the webcast. Uh, if you uh, update your status in Facebook, you tweet, you snap, you whatever. Um, our handle is at SEMPTE Connect, as you can see on the screen, and the hashtag is hashtag SEMPTE Webcast. Now, I said uh, special uh, uh, special guest speaker, um, ex-colleague who used to be on uh, SEMPTE staff, and I'm looking forward to uh, his presentation. Many of you probably know uh, Peter. So, uh, Peter, I'm going to go away, and I'm going to hand the floor over to you. Peter? Thank you very much, Joe, and good day, everyone. Thank you very much for uh, joining this webcast. It's nice to see so many people have an interest in this. Um, I'm going to start with a disclaimer. As Joel said, this is not a standard yet we're talking about. It's a project in development. And SEMPTE is generally very reluctant to talk about things that aren't finished yet because we have to be extremely careful that manufacturers don't run off and develop something that, and in the meantime, the document gets changed. And then there's a big argument about which is the right way to do it and so on. So uh, we don't uh, talk about detailed content of documents, or certainly not what goes on in the committees. Uh, but in this case particular, um, Bruce Devlin, the standards vice president, uh, felt that getting a, a wider audience to be aware of what's going on with this project could help us get the right participants uh, and also uh, possibly uh, you know, get you involved uh, you have some better ideas, more applications, whatever. So the big caveat is I'm going to tell you what I can about where we're at at the moment, but anything you hear is subject to change. So let's talk very briefly about some of the history in here. Originally, videotape editing was cut and splice, uh, required a very high skill level because uh, you had to cut the uh, two inch quad tape in those days on exactly the right slant to go between two tracks that the rotating heads had put on. Um, Ampex came up with a uh, fluid called Ediview that you could paint onto the tape so you could actually see where the recordings have been made. But it did require a very high skill level and it was not very reliable. The splice might or might not go through the heads when you replayed the tape. Electronic editing came along in the 60s 
uh, by permitting a, a recording machine to switch from playback to record without a discontinuity. So you could play up to the edit point and then go into record and uh, record something coming from a second machine. That, of course, relied on the quality of the second generation being acceptable, which was marginal in those days, uh, but the advantages of uh, electronic editing uh, you know, made it really essential. Um, if you went with the original electronic editor and just punched the record button, um, that was fine if you got your timing right. Uh, if you hadn't, you wrecked the recording, you were in the process of editing. Uh, Edutech came out of Ampex as one of the first systems that did provide you the ability to uh, rehearse uh, the cut, decide, yes, that's the right place, and then go ahead and do it for real. But that was a single edit. There was no real timeline for the program as a whole. This was recognized as a serious deficiency, and various editing companies, and there were a lot of them in those days, uh, introduced time codes as ways of uh, providing you know, a continuous timeline from one end of the program to the other. That, of course, um, Oh, I oh, just wanted to show you quickly, here's a, a splicer, and this uh, picture came from the Early Television Foundation. So you'd paint on your edit view, uh, have the two-inch tape running through the blocks there, uh, a microscope to try and align where you did your cut with the uh, lines of the recording, uh, and so on. Dodgy procedure. The other problem, of course, to give you an idea, um, of how important this was, at least in retrospect. Uh, I was looking at the timeline from the papers of uh, Clay Whitehead, and in 1969, he found three things worthy of comment. A random access audio cartridge machine, uh, 70 time code established when the chaos of incompatible time codes, and oh, by the way, Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. So how did we get to that? Early in 1969, the 70 videotape committee was told in no uncertain terms that the problem of multiple time codes from different vendors was becoming a major problem and that a standard was urgently needed. Uh, alongside this, um, ABC, CBS, NBC formed an ad hoc committee to draft their requirements. Uh, they did liaise with the Videotape Production Association and they reported back um, in April of 1970 with the report of the ad hoc committee that said these are the requirements. At that stage, the Videotape Committee started a subcommittee to draft a standard, obviously, as always, with users and manufacturers. And it was determined that uh, not only was the list of requirements uh, from the ad hoc pretty good, there were some minor changes made, um, there was a lot of cooperation between the competing vendors who'd uh, got their time codes or already going, but recognized the, that they weren't going to be going anywhere if they weren't part of the standard. Uh, so they came up with a draft standard that met all the requirements of the ad hoc group. And time code editing re really took off. Just as a thing, this eventually became a American national standard uh, in 1974. Um, just a, a brief extract here that uh, the, it, and you can read these if you look at the slides later on, I won't waste time on them now. Uh, but it is interesting to note that this was uh, for record, an audio rec signal for recording on the Q track of the quad machines. And if you look at 6.3 on the right, they had contemplated carrying um, time code in the vertical interval, but didn't at that stage have a method of doing so. So a quick review of what 7012 is about. And the reason I'm doing this so much is uh, to give you an idea of how high the barrier is for something to be a successor to ST12. Uh, it was designed you know, according to the technology requirements of the day. So it was designed as an audio signal to record on the Q track of the Quad VTR, biphase encoding 80 bits per frame. Uh, that 80 bits included a sync signal, which was uh, one polarity at one end and another polarity at the other. So you can tell which direction 
uh, you were reading in because otherwise you wouldn't be able to interpret the time code when spooling backwards. The display format of choice of the day was a Nixie tube and the cheapest way to drive a Nixie tube was if you had BCD data uh, to feed to it or feed to the chip that drove it and so BCD was uh, uh, adopted as the data format and it would convey uh, eight uh, BCD uh, values for hours, minutes, seconds and frames and it was, by the way, very quickly harmonized with EBU's approach to for 25 frames per second. So the time code became something that was universal uh, for 24, though that wasn't used very much to start with, uh, 25, 30, and 2997. Problem running 2997 was you had something that looked like a clock, uh, but wasn't actually true time. It was running 0.1% slow. So drop frame mode was provided so that uh, you could get approximately real-time displays with non-intruder frame rates. And worthy of note also, there were user bits included in this and other eight uh, uh, four-bit uh, locations. Uh, unspecified how they use, no obligation to use them whatsoever. So despite the fact that it was designed with all those uh, 1970 constraints, um, it's been an incredibly robust standard with all sorts of things uh, added on, tweaks, keeping backward compatibility in general, but uh, here's just a few of the things, uh, putting date and time in the user bits or having a page line directory index so you put almost anything in the user bits. Um, the expanded to handle uh, 60 hertz, expanded to uh, handle progressive, expanded eventually to handle 120 hertz, but there really isn't room for any more tweaks. And this has reached, uh, you know, such a level of complexity that I don't think there's anyone would say in Sempty who would be prepared to take on the job of revising it yet again. Uh, it's there, it's incredibly useful today. It has some limitations but they're not insurmountable and 7012 is still a very viable um, standard even though it's actually 50 years since the original was drafted and that's a mind-boggling result and as I say it still meets at least 90 percent of people's requirements even today and something to replace it has got to be really good so that's what we're trying to do for so Hans Hoffman and I had a discussion back in 2007 uh, where Hans said, isn't it a bit silly that we're using uh, in the, at that time about a 40-year-old standard called black and burst or color black for synchronizing signals in a digital age where it's coming to the stage where black burst is the only analog signal we have to handle and it's a pain to handle because it's actually quite a difficult, difficult signal to distribute in good quality. And why are we doing that in the digital age? And I countered with, I absolutely agree, let's talk about it. And by the way, shouldn't we be talking about a standard with similar vintage, which is time code? So we formed a task force and had a very active participation from people all over the world uh, to look at requirements for new systems. And the task force provided a report uh, with requirements in 2008 and requested that SEMTI develop appropriate standards. Uh, we also in 2008 had a meeting with uh, some of the Hollywood Post professionals uh, at Ampas, where after not a very long meeting, there was pretty good agreement around the table that what they would like to see as a new, new time label for the future would be what they christened the digital birth certificate, which had a timestamp, a source ID saying where did the signal come from, and the counter, because it's always useful to have a media unit counter. So work started first um, on both synchronization and uh, time labeling. 
Now, the synchronization was really interesting because the task force work had gone through all the normal uh, procedures of saying, well, what frameworks do we want to accommodate? And is there a magic number that's an integral integer multiple of all of them? And that gets really difficult. And if we want to allow other time frames, it gets uh, time rate frame rates, it gets even more difficult. And the, the breakthrough on that was really Paul Briscoe, who said, look, if you have a high precision time standard and use a digital phase lock loop, you can generate any frequency with very high accuracy and stability. And we don't need a magic number. All we need is a high precision time source. So that was what led to 702059 family, uh, which uses the uh, precision time protocol uh, of IEEE 1588 uh, to uh, uh, provide messages over uh, a network to allow uh, items of equipment to synchronize uh, much as they would have done with color black distribution before. So that's sort of a side, but it's crucial to where uh, the, the origins of TLX. So some work went on with time codes and there was some excellent work by two groups, unfortunately. Um, who both of which either of which could have probably produced a very acceptable standard but they did have different concepts and nobody neither group could actually gain a consensus of sufficient people to say this is the one way we go let's abandon another route uh, but nonetheless provided a really sound basis of work uh, that could be used to help us in the future in 2016 howard Luck, who was then the engineering uh, director at SMPTE, organized time code summits in LA, New York, and London to go over some of this stuff, to look at what the existing problems really were, and uh, prioritize the requirements for a new time labeling system. Uh, that included support of uh, lots of media rates, I won't say any, but lots of media, media, uh, media rates, including integer and non-integer, support of very high and very low rates, support of variable, variable rate acquisition, if we could, uh, you know, overcranking, undercranking. We want a label that's not limited to 24 hours duration. And we need to be able to, if we come up with a new standard, have translation mechanisms so that we can really work with a mix of SC12 and the new label because nothing is going to replace SC12 overnight. It's going to be a multi-year transition. Uh, SC12 is so embedded in the work that's done today that it's going to be with us for a long time. So I then said, well, <laughs> all right, perhaps we should stop trying to boil the ocean. Uh, and there really was an express need uh, for, uh, from the uh, Hollywood meeting for the digital birth certificate uh, that basically met all of the requirements that we just discussed that came out of the, uh, out of the time code summits. So I said, well, let's start something with a pretty narrow focus and say, let's include a precision time value uh, a persistent source identifier and the media unit counter. And by the way, while we're doing it, let's define a mechanism in the standard for adding new data fields uh, if, you know, turns out that those are needed by the industry. What we wanted to do was avoid substantive revision of the standard or worse still starting over because adding new stuff broke what we'd done before. So the concept of providing uh, an extension mechanism was very critical to the concept of TLX, which, by the way, originally we said extensible time label, but when we wanted to come up with a moniker for it, TLX ran up the tongue uh, more easily than anything else we could think of, so we went with TLX. And Joel, do we have a question? 
Well, we do have a question. It was the very first question that we received while I was uh, in just uh, opening the webcast, and it's from Martin. Um, he would like to know how the relationship between TLX and PTP timing uh, is established or, or will be established. Uh, I'm on the way to that, so I will get to that quite soon. Very good. But thanks for the question. So initial topics we looked at when we started talking about this in the drafting group were the digital birth certificate, as we'd outlined, and the mechanism for doing extensibility, because we didn't want to get too far along the process without addressing that elephant in the room, if you like, that uh, for, for this to meet its requirements, we really did have to come up with a relative simple way of adding uh, other fields to it in the future. So uh, one of our colleagues in the UK said, well, all right, why don't we adopt, uh, call it key length value, tag length value uh, system, uh, whichever you want, where each data field is identified by a tag um, immediately followed by the length of the value and the, of the item and then the value. So that's a mechanism that was originally developed in uh, during the development of MXF and so on. It's proved to be very, very versatile. It's a bit bulky in its basic form because it uses 16-byte identifiers, uh, but various mechanisms have evolved for uh, within the construct of a single standard using a much shorter identifier uh, for each of the fields you're interested in, and that, of course, is the approach we take with TLX. Um, so the, uh, we, did, we went through <laughs> several meetings, if not many meetings, uh, talking about terminology. Uh, everything you talk about is overloaded and liable to cause confusion. So we eventually came up with something we thought was fairly descriptive and uh, would not cause a lot of confusion with other things in the industry. So we decided to call the individual data fields items or TLX item. Uh, so each data value possibly with associated metadata is a TLX item and will have a tag in the uh, KLV TLV system. When we started discussing this, we also came up with another issue of said, well, if we envisage that people will, other than, like ST12 was used in many industries other than television, uh, if the same thing happens with TLX, different people are going to want different items, and we're going to, perhaps going to end up with a large number of items defined. And it could be a bit of a Wild West situation if you come to uh, try and pass a TLX label, and it could have you know, any number of items in it, um, some of which you might support, some of which you might not. Uh, we thought there's a way, we need a way to help constrain this where necessary. And so we also came up with the idea of TLX profile, which I'll discuss in detail in a minute, but basically says some rules for which items you can use and so on. And then, of course, we had to discuss the overall structure of what makes a TLX label and how do you go ahead with it. Uh, it was slow, and let me skip this round. We're back. Okay, so here comes the question about time representation. And let me say at the beginning, uh, not everyone in the TLX family is uh, firmly in love with PTP, uh, but uh, we th the, thought there were some good reasons for specifying that as the uh, time mechanism for uh, the digital birth certificate, even though we may come up with alternative items that uh, convey different time re representations. The IEEE 1588 is widespread and there's network hardware available that natively supports 1588 messages. Uh, so it's quite good for uh, networks that conceivably will convey 2059 messages, which have also which are 1588 uh, based. Uh, 
the time values available from GPS with nanosecond resolution, and PTB provides 48 bits for seconds and 32 bits for nanoseconds. If I did my calculations right, the uh, 48 bits is about 9 million years, something like that. So if we run out of bits on that, I personally am not going to be very concerned about it. Uh, the nanosecond resolution uh, provides adequate precision for frame rates up to at least one megaframe per second, uh, probably considerably more than that, but it, it gets up into very high frame rates without a problem. The main thing from my perspective was PTP has been adopted for 2059 for synchronization and for the 2110 family for uh, video over managed IP networks. And it would be really nice not to be doing conversions among time representations among the key standards. And really 2059 and 2110 are key standards in the modern era. We hope that TLX will be another one in that group. And that to my mind was a major argument in favor of providing uh, for TLX, uh, for PTP within TLX. Uh, so but as I said, I'm having you know, trouble understanding right now. Please try a little later. Uh oh. Do I have audio problems, Joe? You do not. Oh, okay. Uh, something funny happened. Anyway, um, guys, I mentioned the, we, there may well be other time representations defined for TLX, and the magic profile will probably determine which one you use for a given application. So let's look at the basic structures of how we think a TLX label will come together. And just a reminder, these are still fluid. We've got to uh, make the whole thing be flexible and extensible. And we do get new ideas thrown in the pot even now. And until we get the standard out there, nothing is fixed in concrete. But we will have uh, a TLX header, uh, which will have an identifier for TLX itself. And there are actually two possibilities at the moment. Uh, one approach is to say uh, that the header just includes the length of the header payload, which is the profile identifier. Or it could be that the right way to do the header is to make the length, the length of the whole label. Uh, so you've got a uh, pre-warning of uh, how long this thing's going to go on uh, and just include the TLX profile as metadata. So e either way, there, there are uh, arguments both ways. And then there will be a sequence of TLX, one or more TLX items. Um, and again, the TLX item will consist of its tag or key, uh, which is the identifier for this item within the context of a TLX label. Uh, the length of the payload and the value. And again, the value can be a, a specific value uh, plus in some cases metadata associated with that value. So I mentioned profiles and this was the concept we came up with for stopping things be uh, too Wild West. And when you receive a TLX label, giving you the opportunity to know something about what you were about to pass before you started dealing with it. Again, the idea is that it should, should be something very flexible, uh, application oriented, and it may specify one or more TLX items as being mandatory. Yes, Joe? Um, Spike has a question. Um, is TL intended to be a separate signal or simply another flow on the converged IP network? Uh, we're talking that, about that with the 21 pe 10 people at the moment. Um, I think it will, I mean, TLX in itself is going to be transport independent, transport agnostic, uh, and each, trans each application will, will obviously need to define uh, a transport mechanism for it. Uh, in the case of 2110, um, we're going to defer to the 2110 experts and let them tell us how to carry it. And that's part of an ongoing conversation at the moment. 
Great, thank you. Um, I do want to take a moment to remind our guests that questions are welcome at any time. And the preferred means of asking questions to Peter is uh, they are uh, oral questions. So please type, I have an oral question, and you go right to the top of the list. And now I will. OK. So going back to profiles, it may specify one or more TLX items as being mandatory. So for example, if we have a profile that's the digital birth certificate, it would probably specify that three items be mandatory, the time label, the source ID, and the count. Uh, it may or may not permit additional TLX items. It may constrain the size of this complete label. And so far as I'm envisaging at the moment, we can see no reason why profiles if it's useful, couldn't include multi-part rules such as, I just made up something for the sake of argument here, that item A is mandatory, B, C, and D are optional, but if B is present, you must also have C, and the maximum label size can't exceed 256 bytes. I'm not suggesting that in itself is useful, but just to give an idea that uh, we think that you can basically put any logical rules you like into a profile um, so long as they're appropriately defined and that will not cause any difficulties with the rest of the system. Again, it's early days. We may find there are reasons for limiting uh, things that we don't know at the moment, but that's the current thinking. So here's a diagram of a uh, TLX label in one possible configuration. Uh, we have, in, in this example, the label itself is shown as the value of the, uh, the V of the KLV for the label. So there would be a 16-byte empty universal label um, followed by the length of the label and then the structure you see down below. Whether or not you use the 16-byte UL depends, of course, on the transport system. If, for example, I'm sure one of the things we'll define uh, for transport is 7291 ancillary data, in which case there will be a specific identifier within 291 to define the payload, and there would be no need to carry that 16-byte UL because you've already said by virtue of the, the transport identifier that this is a TLX label. Uh, then the uh, so the header is the, the beginning followed by all of the TLX data and each item has its own tag uh, its length and its value and they'd be defined in a second document I'm not sure I uh, specified the structure we're looking at at the moment I think I forgot to put a slide in for that but what we're looking at at the moment is uh, the 2120-1 uh, would be the definition of the label and the structure. Um, the Obviously, the, T, the TLX identifier, how the header is done, and the rules for uh, putting uh, items into a label and for how to pass the label. The dash two document, we expect to define the TLX items. And the idea of this is that there'd be some definition of uh, the overall structure of an item, the mechanism that's to be used for adding addition, defining additional items in the future, which basically we envisage as an amendment to the dash two document, and then most uh, you know items will be defined by uh, a one or two page uh, set of rules uh, that says th this is how the, what the data is and how it goes into that item. Yes, Joe. Yes, um, our good friend Howard asks um, on on the top level of the picture, is that a KLV transport and not a part of TLX? Oh, KLV is the construct. KLV is key length value as defined by a empty standard that should be on the tip of my tongue, but isn't. Um, and uh, subsequent things, in fact, if we go back uh, one slide, various uh, 
subsequent standards have identified ways of using KLV, such as ST2003, um, with smaller tags. So uh, the, that's why we have uh, some discrepancy between KLV and TLV, which really mean the same thing, except KLV I used to say this is something with uh, a true 16-byte empty UL defined in the metadata dictionary. Um, TLV is a bit more generic, where the T is a tag which might be a full UL or might be some uh, attenuated version of, of, of a UL. So I ho hope that clarifies, but uh, please come back with more questions if it didn't make sense. And he did. <laughs> um, okay. he, he followed up. Is, uh, uh, is the top, it says, is the top layer a part of TLX? Hey, Howard, do you want to talk to talk to Peter? Yeah, what we're saying is the, the, the top layer defines the label. And the label, uh, the, uh, we'll go back to this uh, slide again. So the whole label is a KLV construct. So it's in got a 16 byte UL and the length and then the total value that represents the data of the label. Within that, the different items that may be in that label are themselves identified by a KLV type construct, but in most cases, we don't expect that to be a 16 byte UL. We expect it to be something like a 2003 uh, uh, tag length value uh, construct with much shorter tags to, for just to keep the data compact. So the overall structure of a label is in itself a KLV uh, construct and the individual items within a label are some modified form of KLV for greater compactness. He says, ah, okay, that answers it. Um, okay. Yoshiaki-san uh, has a question. Okay. Um, why adopt a single KLV packet containing TLV sequence as its value rather than the KLV local set commonly adopted for MXF? I think, uh, as I said, the uh, what use happens to the identifier will very much depend on the application. If it's transported, uh, for example, by means of a uh, 7291, uh, the U, the 16 byte UL would not be used because the 291 uh, definition would in itself uh, define that this was a TLX label. So the, the whole concept of local sets and this sort of thing is very much the direction we're going. This is not fully defined at the moment. We did get a bit of help to give us some of the concepts early on, but we will be talking with the experts about the best way to do the, the structure within the label. Uh, as we go forward. And again? Yes, I should have kept my camera on. Uh, Dragan asks, um, how are TLX items generated or how could they be generated? Okay, they will be defined in the Dash 2 document and the definition will be, uh, here is a full 16 byte UL for this, here is the reduced tag that would be used within a local set. Um, this is the uh, structure of the data within an item. Uh, it might just be a single uh, value um, which you define what, what it is, what it means, uh, what its length is, uh, or it may have multiple values and or it may have metadata to say this is what uh, and a good example of this, for example, would be PTP itself, uh, which at a minimum will have a uh, PTP value uh, and will also have uh, at least some of the metadata that's included in the 2059-2 profile, for example, a local offset. So the PTP value would be uh, UTC and you'd have a metadata item uh, defined as part of that TLX item that said you also need to include this local offset and, and very possibly other values as well. We're working on the definitions now. Uh, does that answer the question, I wonder? 
I think it does. Thank you. Okay. So we have a few TLX items already being worked on. Um, the timestamp is obviously one of these. Uh, we will define a PTP, or it's possible we'll define a timestamp that includes metadata to say what sort of time identifier it is. Uh, I think as the uh, these may you know, be defined by different industries, different applications. It's probably better to have one for PTP and then create new items for different time representations and use whichever is appropriate. Uh, source ID uh, will probably be uh, one of two possible items or uh, might be used together. Uh, the original source idea ID is we want something that's as so far as possible uh, irrevocably tied to the piece of equipment. So a MAC address or other unique identifier is a good way to go. These are not truly immutable. People can change network cards and this sort of thing, but um, that's something of which a record would probably be made. Uh, basically, so far as possible, we want to say, uh, that this identifier says we know which piece of equipment that came from. Uh, there may, of course, be uh, multiple streams coming from a, same, uh, from a uh, single piece of equipment. It might, for example, have an audio stream and a video stream um, or you know, various other possibilities. Uh, so uh, we do want the idea of being all able to say uh, this is say, number one of n possible streams from uh, this source. That seemed to be a fairly good way to go. We certainly recognize there were some uh, source types that may not have MAC addresses. So we are looking at other identifiers to include there, and it would be identified by metadata uh, which um, a particular uh, type of identifier you were getting. Uh, one of the reasons for that, of course, is somebody said, well, wait a minute, what about virtual machines, uh, which of course come into existence and then go out of existence. Uh, so there will be some form of identifier specified to use with virtual machines as well, uh, just to separate uh, that from anything else you might do. Uh, the media unit count sounds simple, uh, it's actually a subject of a good deal of discussion about exactly how we do this, whether there should be one or more than one, uh, what should trigger it, uh, possibly triggered by a record button or something like that. Again, very much in discussion, but we, we will have some form of count representation. And then there are lots of other things uh, we could put uh, in TLX items, and that's going to depend on who wants to do what with TLX. Location data is an obvious example. We might want to put GPS data in there. Uh, information about the program, uh, title, scene, the take number uh, might be relevant. And that also leads to a discussion that's ongoing about, well, TLX's his concept is that we have a label uh, for each media unit, each frame, whatever it may be. Uh, but there's also a lot of information that's stable uh, throughout a take or throughout a program. Uh, should we have uh, TLX profiles that carry only persistent data? And that's very much an ongoing discussion. Uh, TLX could be used for uh, conveying motion data to um, uh, you know, be used in terms uh, in uh, subsequent model work. Uh, it could carry haptic data if you want to provide the touch mechanisms, uh, alternative time representations. There's really no limit, as we can see at the moment, for what things might be useful or any particular def difficulty in defining them to fit in the TLX concept. Yes, Joel. Uh, yes, Willis asks, um, there appears to be crossover with other metadata protocols. Are there efforts to harmonize so metadata can be entered once and carried over to other metadata structures? 
that's going to be an ongoing thing. We have had some discussions uh, in particular uh, with uh, Merrill Weiss, uh, whose uh, group uh, is uh, looking at how you assemble metadata such that it can be included with an archive. Uh, he's, he and uh, users are facing the issue that uh, lots of metadata is collected uh, or is used during the production of a program or uh, event, and most of that ends up on bits of uh, legal pads or things ended up in the, in a garbage bin, uh, and there's no real good way to collect data for use in an archive, which means most archives actually miss out on having what could be incredibly useful metadata included with them. So yes, we're talking with Merrill. Uh, the whole idea of TLX is that it's just a data structure uh, that can very easily accommodate and either transmit or put in a uh, uh, file format um, items of data that are defined. Uh, it would be a very simple matter to have a TLX item that said, this is metadata as defined by this old, uh, outside document um, and if we take that approach, it should be very easy to move such information between a TLX representation or another representation. And, and of course, we've also got to be careful not to say that TLX should be the way you do everything. Uh, TLX is there with some items defined that we think will meet industry needs with an extension mechanism that should allow it to do lots of other things but we're certainly not trying to say that you should do everything with TLX. Yes, Joe. Um, Howard said uh, that a TLX item could be a link to other data. It says some of us don't want to clog up TLX. Absolutely. Very yeah. good point. Yes, it could be a um, point, just a pointer. Yeah, Alexander uh, asks, uh, do you think TLX could challenge the SCTE standards for in-band signaling, such as SCTE 35 or 104? I don't know. Uh, I mean, I, I, I'm going to say it's possible because we're trying to put something together with virtually anything possible. Uh, but as I just said, that doesn't mean that TLX is the right approach for everything. If you're dealing with a very specified environment uh, where uh, standards have been developed to meet particular uh, real-time or other needs, uh, it's conceivable that TLX might provide a better way of doing some of them, but it's very likely that the mechanisms have been defined have been defined the way they are because they're the best way of doing the job. So I certainly, you know, we're not looking to poach on everybody's territory, but if we uh, provide a mechanism that potentially is useful for them, we'd obviously be very willing to work with them if they see uh, an application that we could support. So continuing on, uh, oh, went two slides again. I talked about profiles, and again, this is still in the very early discussion phase. Uh, possible profiles obviously include the digital birth certificate that I mentioned before. Uh, we could have an almost no restrictions that says uh, this profile permits you to do anything with any number of uh, SEMPTI defined items uh, and doesn't include any length or other restrictions, uh, just stick with SEMPTI defined items. We could have a profile that says the profile for this is actually defined within a class 14 uh, proprietary environment. Um, just go look at the, if you're a uh, the owner of the class 14 entry, you can go and define within that your tags, your uh, de definitions, and but don't look for there to be 70 values in here necessarily. Uh, it's possible, and, I, and I'm really just speculating and thinking aloud at the moment, uh, but we might have something that says it's totally unconstrained. Uh, there's a 16 byte UL that says this is TLX and within that all of the items aren't necessarily defined 
uh, within any SEMPTE dictionary. And so they need full 16 bit byte ULs uh, to tell you what the item means. Is that useful? I have no idea. Uh, just uh, throwing out ideas. There may be specific protocols for transmission or due to distribution because, for example, a high precision time value from acquisition uh, is potentially has a forensic value and might be considered confidential and, you know, things like locations and this sort of thing. You and other metadata you may not want to have in there. So there may be much more restricted profiles to say the only TLX items you put in a uh, transmission or distribution uh, label for my application are the following items and don't put anything else. Again, trying to make this flexible, it's the applications that will define what actually gets done here. As I said, TLX uh, is going to be, needs to be transport agnostic. We will define TLX items we have decided by means of an XML schema. Um, and there will be some associations with uh, known transport, excuse me, known transport systems such as 2110 streams, uh, 291 for ancillary data. Uh, we think there's a means for encapsulating reasonably small TLX tables within AES3 streams. We will go and talk with our AES colleagues about that. And we certainly need to cope, uh, cater for XML and JSON representations. And there are probably many, many more. The concept of the standards process is that we'll define the dash one, dash two, dash three standards for the structure, the items, and the profiles, and then go on with additional uh, parts of the family uh, that will define the various uh, transport and encapsulation mechanisms, again, as defined by the applications and with the assistance of the experts in that area. So the work in progress is, is a lot, as you've probably gathered by now, the basic structure. Uh, we're going to be talking with our colleagues in the uh, metadata committee about the uh, use of universal labels and their attempt there. Uh, we're talking about uh, stream identification uh, as possibly, as I mentioned, as possibly as part of the uh, source identifier so that we could identify multiple streams from a common source. Uh, we're looking at definitions of uh, metadata support known applications. And uh, these are some of the things I've already talked about. Uh, also within that, the possibility that, you know, we may want to convey more than one, for example, PTP value uh, within a label uh, saying, okay, this was the original acquisition time. Uh, this is the timestamp associated with uh, the, uh, uh, linear production of uh, a program that includes that. Uh, so we might want an instance uh, identifier uh, to say, you know, here, here, here was number one value, here is number two value, and so on. That could apply to a, a number of the possible items there. So we think we'll probably try and come up with a uh, generalized uh, instance um, for any items where that's appropriate. And of course, we're, as we talk, we're starting to draft documents. And when you start to write things down, that's a very good reminder of the things you haven't thought about yet. And uh, good um, things uh, you thought you've got a good answer when you actually come to write it down. Maybe it's not as uh, perfect as you thought it was. And not an uncommon thing in standards development. So that's pretty well what I have to say today. Uh, if you're interested, please join us. Um, the, the this presentation, I said paper, but uh, uh, describe. You know, I've tried to talk about the current thinking and where we're going, but there's a lot of work to done, to be done. If you've got better ideas, please come along and tell us. If you have different applications, please join us and tell us. Uh, there's a drafting group that meets uh, weekly 
uh, actually about in about half an hour from now today and on the uh, uh, same time each week. Uh, we'd love to have you join us if you can contribute. Uh, there's a contact for uh, the chair, or of course uh, you can just uh, go through the workspace structure and join uh, the 32NF committee if you're not a member at the moment, and then the Dash 80 working group, and then the extensible time label drafting group. And um, we'd be very pleased to have you. And that's what I have as my presentation for today. Thank you for hanging in there if you did. And if you've got any more questions, I'll be delighted to try and answer them. Oh, and I did have yeah. one more slide. Yeah, sure uh, yeah. Just to yeah. acknowledge John Wilkie's work as the chair of this group, uh, all of the drafting group members, we've got some really good experts who come from very different viewpoints, but we've got into a really good level of cooperation now, and uh, we, we think we're making good progress. And we have uh, had some support uh, to help with travel expenses and event attendance from the companies listed there. And we really are very, very grateful for that. Thank you, Peter. We do have a couple of questions in the queue. Um, let's see. Uh, first of all, Hugh says, uh, Peter, thank you. Um, Spike asks, uh, going back to referring back to when you were talking about what would uh, be in TLX, he says, um, is there a risk in trying to include too much disparate data into TLX that it becomes too heavy and complex for its fundamental and key purpose? I think that that's really what led us to the concept of profiles. We, we wanted to provide something that, you know, first of all, met the requirements that have been laid down, and we think the digital birth certificate does that. Uh, and keeps that you know well constrained and addressing the principal uh, requirements we did commit from the beginning to the concept of making it extensible and the definition of items was how we decided to uh, invoke that extensibility capability and we don't think that um, causes any problem with uh, you know, keeping it c c concise and so long as people just don't keep throwing things in there and I think as the probably questioner is suggesting, uh, come up with a system where when you get a TLX label, it might contain anything, it might be three bytes long, it might go on forever. Um, there, there needs to be a way of constraining that. So my concept here is that I see a number of possible profiles uh, for use in the space that's really the successor to uh, 70 time code. And that's probably the digital birth certificate, plus possibly one or two other items that people might want to define and might or not you might or not want, might not want to use, sorry. Um, even within that environment, we see uh, the ability to the and value to having different profiles because you may well want information in a source uh, uh, material about acquisition times and this sort of thing that you don't want in uh, later on in the process, or you may want to retain but not make uh, generally available. Uh, so we, we see some flexibility there. At the other extreme, uh, if somebody wants to use uh, the TLX structure for something totally different, and I don't even know a good idea now, defining a profile there to say, yes, this is a TLX label, but the items I'm going to include there are the number of pints of milk I delivered today uh, and the expected uh, you know, shelf life of this. So be it. If it's a profile that defined that, if those items are defined and a profile says you use those items, and I'm not suggesting that's sensible, just trying to give a what I see as the uh, potential applications of this is that someone whose application may be associated with media, maybe something totally different, uh, if they want to use the structure, it doesn't hurt anybody else for us to let them define an item or multiple items and define a profile that says 
this is how we use those items. I don't think that uh, causes any unfortunate generalization from the point of people who want to use it as a replacement for time code. Mm -hmm. Okay, we do have a couple of questions in the queue here, and uh, Spike says thank you. Um, I would uh, like to remind our uh, guests that uh, oral questions are welcome. You can have a, a brief conversation with Peter if you'd like, and uh, maybe a question and then a follow-up question. Just type in, I'd like to ask Peter a question, or I have an oral question, whatever. Um, and I will unmute you, and uh, you can uh, you can speak to him. Uh, let's see, Paul. Paul is interested in hearing if there have been any new concepts discussed for handling high frame rates for super slow motion cameras. Uh, well, we did come up with, uh, and I'm not uh, an expert on this, but uh, we did come up with uh, a revision of uh, 7012-3. Uh, we, and if Howard's online, he could uh, say a bit more about that uh, because that was specifically his requirements looking for the way of handling 120 framework that they were doing. Uh, I believe we came up with uh, a useful standard to accommodate that. Again, Howard can comment. But I think I also brought to everyone's attention that the time has gone trying to stop doing fixes or add-ons to uh, 7012 because it's you know it probably been stretched as far as it can uh, but as I say I think you said there was a question if that was a, if that was Howard Luck uh, he might want to come on and give a comment on that as well okay yeah Howard uh, just um, let me know if you'd like me to unmute your microphone and uh, if you'd like to explain it in the meantime um, oh Paul says thank you Peter uh, Willis says uh, or asks uh, is there any thought to accommodating embedding, e.g. for a ST2022 implementation as opposed to an ST2110 implementation? I don't see any reason why not. We have not as yet addressed that. Uh, we would need to speak to the experts about what we should do, how we should do it. Uh, and so there's someone who should join our group. Very good. Uh, and uh, Howard says he has to run the classes. He says uh, maybe next time. Thanks, Peter. Great job. Uh, that is our final question as of this moment. So, sometimes when I say that, though, another one pops in. Uh, but um, I do want to uh, uh, ask you just to reiterate that this uh, is uh, a standard that is very much still in the works, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> um, so, as I said at the beginning, anything you hear today may be subject to change, uh, as I've tried to outline. I mean, we, we think we are on a track to creating a really good and useful standard, uh, but the value of this will be very much determined by uh, those people who come to us, uh, you know, help us put it together, come up with new applications, uh, potentially identify holes we may have left, uh, the uh, participation is a really important thing, and we really encourage people to do that. Great. Uh, Spike says, uh, when when do you anticipate TLX will be uh, implemented in the marketplace? <laughs> I know that's a tough question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, as I said to someone recently, you know, uh, I would be hopeful that we might get the first three documents out this year, but I'll, you'll probably be asking me about that statement a year from now. Um, it's, it's very difficult to get. I mean, I think we are making good progress, but um, there's much wider audiences to expose this to before it uh, e even becomes a draft standard. Uh, so, uh, and then, uh, you know, as we start to put things together, I think it's something that, uh, manufacturers will be able to experiment with at a relatively early stage if they're involved in the committee uh, because it's obviously going to be very, very largely software based. Uh, and so it's less, in, you know, less of a problem if you create something and the standard changes. Uh, it's, it's the implementations that will probably uh, the early implementations will probably start to point out where we've gone wrong or where we could do better. Uh, so we're hopeful that people will start 
coming up with test implementations pretty early in the process and that in itself will help us write a better standard and hopefully get it done in a reasonable length of time because there will be less questions to answer. So Spike follows up. He says, okay, years. Uh, yeah. then, <laughs> then he says again, thanks. Uh, that is our final question, Peter. I, I very much enjoyed uh, listening to you present and working with you on this. Uh, it was uh, good to see you uh, uh, last week and uh, hope that you'll uh, come back sometime and uh, give us an update on uh, the standard, especially after it's uh, completed. Um, also, to want do oh, I'm sorry. I'll be delighted to do so. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I'd like to thank our guests for uh, spending time with us today and for sticking it out for those of you that did. And uh, we will see you hopefully next time on the next SIMPTI standards webcast or any of the other uh, webcast series that we have. So uh, take care. Safe travels. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, everyone. Bye now.